Thank you. It was fascinating, and I'm going to just um, get on with the questions. But I just had one thought. I mean, this is really coming from a space of ignorance. Really, you talked about how you know they use local, almost colloquial narratives and ethos to kind of draw in a larger crowd. But on the other hand, the restrictive role of women is very true there, right? So while you're trying to draw in a larger you know space in terms of women drawing them in, and you're saying their whole ideas of rearing children, passing on the ideology. On the other hand, I mean, if you're looking at 2001 onwards, Pakistan, everywhere else, uh, mm -hmm. liberalism and Asma Zainger is just one, you know, example of how she's taken that movement forward. Not only on human rights, but being able to, you know, hold your mm -hmm. own, take a position, move on with it. So isn't that restrictive? I mean, the Dawa was trying to draw in more people. On the other hand, uh, giving women a, you know, a confined position, isn't that kind of, again, closing the space? So while you're using local narratives to draw in, but you're also, you know, restricting the movement really. I wouldn't read it like that. I think what you really, and if I get your question right, at one level, what we have is in Pakistani society, the difference between people like Asma Jahangir on the one hand, and then uh, Rahil Kazi on the other, you know, with jamaat -e islami but then other women who are also like that. But overall, that there's a mixing and matching. And I think as times have changed and there's been more exchange of information and ideas across the world, what at least what I've noticed is that what does it mean to be a Muslim woman of any sort of color and to be in Pakistan? It's been constantly shifting. So there are lots of different ideas that have been brought in. What jamaat dawa is doing is trying to protect or isolate these women from this external influence that they think will dilute their support for the jihadi project. So it's not that they're cutting their sort of feathers off, so to speak. It's basically they're trying to purify them, but purify them in a way that they think the woman would be more useful. Oh, so so they expensive yeah. idea of the society. It's not limited okay. just to yeah. add one woman. Does All that right. answer? Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very complex. I mean, you know, it's for you to kind of put it also succinctly. It's fabulous. Thank you. Uh, I think see Divya, she's got three questions. Can I just ask you to come up with just one? Because you can see the more questions in the chat box. Divya, what is it that you really Ooh. want to talk about? <laughs> Ask me yeah. a question, I won't read it. I'm going to get confused. No, no, that's why I'm making her ask you, but really ask the one which is like really pressing in your mind. Divya, yeah. go ahead. You need to unmute, I think. Divya? Okay, I think there's some uh, thing with the connection. Why don't I come to the next one, which is, uh, Divya, we'll come back to you. Ambassador, <laughs> Ambassador Sanjay Singh, why don't you ask? Unmute, please, and ask yourself. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I was uh, curious to, if you can identify the audience towards whom these narratives are projected. And what their social background, different social background, would there be a differentiation in the narrative? Thank okay, you. very good question. No, thank you. Uh, as I said uh, initially, uh, the audience basically was the rural people, mostly in Punjab, because that's really where uh, Hafiz had started most of its activities initially. But gradually, then uh, the expanded more into the cities in urban areas and then they also uh, gradually they also included more educated people even from uh, more sort of westernized or liberal families i hate to use these terms but i'm just using it to make it simpler and what's interesting is that as that change has taken place at least from the literature that i've read the literature that is written in Urdu is mostly for people who don't understand English. And there's a majority of them. Uh, so that's very simple and that's done in, in ways that uh, people can quickly pick up. So it's more 
colloquial Pakistani way of thinking. When they started focusing more on the urban, but even more educated urban, that's become very obvious in the way the English magazine, Voice of Islam, was presented. Uh, initially, and again, it's just my reading, I may be totally wrong on that, but initially when I think there were fewer people who were from that group that was more literate in English and could understand and maybe more globalized, the Voice of Islam had terrible uh, sort of English standards. Uh, spellings were wrong, grammar was bad, ideas were not clear. You could see somewhat they were talking about jihad, but it was very badly written. So I used to, every time I'd read, I'd think yeah, they really need to know how to edit it. But gradually what you find is that over the number of years, the voice of Islam and the content became more and more professionally edited. And as I said, it's just my assumption or my sense that because they got more people who were involved in this, who had been exposed to better uh, command of English language, the quality of the magazines also improved. Having said that, I think we need to also know that still the majority of the audience still remains not that upper class English literate uh, people, but mostly the middle and the lower middle class. And for that's why most of their publications are in Urdu. I haven't been able to access or read, you know, Sindhi or Baluchi literature, but that's the audience that they write, write it for. Uh, if I come across anything else, maybe I'll be able to write about that too, but that's all I can say at the moment. Thank you. Um, Divya has got bad connection, but Divya, can you come in now? I just told her to switch off her video, but are you able to? I can't see her. Uh, Rohit, would you want to ask your question about the Mujahid and Shahid? Uh, sure, ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your uh, insightful presentation. Uh, ma'am, I have a question. Uh, uh, ma'am, how do you so see the role of LET's uh, publications, specifically dealing with the mothers of, Muja of the so-called Mujahids and uh, <clears throat> the martyrs? Uh, how do they capitalize on the grief of uh, the mothers of the Mujahids? So, for example, there is a work by the name uh, We the Mother of Lashkar-e Taiba by uh, Umay Hamad, the name you mentioned, I guess. So please mm -hmm. comment on that or comment on that. Thank you. All right. And thank you very much. I know it's written as Hamma and Lashkar e Toiba Ki, so we the mothers of Lashkar e Toiba. Uh, basically, it was, if you look at the magazines that were published for Lashkar e Toiba before 9 uh, 11, uh, in fact, even before Kargil, there was constantly, there'll be, Vasiat Nama, or you know, the message written by people before they went into a jihad. And there will be all these stories about what the person wanted, the mother and the sister and the sister-in-law and others, and even men in the family to do. Hamain Lashkar Toibaki, in fact, is sort of a recapitulation of the whole thing. So it gets printed after 9-11 in the new millennium, where Umay Hamad, who also goes with the name of Umay Saad, and was given sort of sort of the position below the rank of Hafiz Said's wife who passed away, but she has been very active. She was given the job to communicate to women that we all have doubts about a jihadi project. Uh, but if you really get in touch with these jihadis, you know the reality that how good it is. And I'm sure, Rohit, if you've seen the uh, forward of that, in that Umay Hamad very clearly writes this story about how she was so annoyed with Hafiz Said, and she went there, and then she sees this experience of jihadi, and then she sort of converted to the project. And now she supports her husband as well, who had already been taken in by the jihadi logic. And then the fact that she identifies herself as Umay Hamad and then Umay Saad basically means that she is the mother who is going to 
promote jihadi uh, boys because that's what she's identifying herself as. It's also a reflection of the Arab culture of being identified as mother of or daughter of or sister of someone. But where the place of publications like this comes in is that it does two things. One, it uses women or female leaders as the agents of converting other women to the project of jihad. Because what they're saying is that while it may be normal and logical for some women to be suspicious of jihadi activity, there are these all other women who have engaged in supporting jihad. And so if they have done that and it's given people sort of a good ticket to the life after, afterwards, uh, it's okay also for other women to engage in that project. But I think there's also another purpose, which is that it brings the relevance of Lashkar Toiba and therefore the fighters into the narration. So it's the fact that it was published after 9-11, uh, after Lashkar Toiba wasn't officially uh, being run in Pakistan and was only restricted to uh, the Kashmiri part. I think it's significant that they're saying that we are still there's an indication, and I might be reading too much, that the link hasn't totally been broken. Otherwise, they could have just said, Hamai, jihadi unki, or something, you know, with the mothers of jihadis. But I think the fact in the title and the content being used to communicate to other women that they need to be coming to this project. Now, I don't know if that answers your question or not. If you want, I can elaborate more. Okay. Uh, thank you, okay. Amit. Yeah, ma'am, it has answered, I guess. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Please do come back if I haven't answered it, because I can sort of answer it in one way, and then I can elaborate if you wish me to. Um, Saad Ahmad, you wanted to ask Professor Yasmin? You want to unmute yourself, Saad? Uh, I think, again, a connection problem. Okay, Sat, yeah. Uh, Professor, yes, thank you for a wonderful uh, explanation of Salafi thinking and so much. I was just wondering that what is actually Salafi thinking, how it is related with women, and you just mentioned that Salafi is limit women to family and sphere. I mean, it was sounding to me that Salafi phenomenon in South Asia is a bit more influenced with the patriarchal understanding, uh, which is a very specific phenomenon of, of uh, India and Pakistan. For example, I just mentioned here, Rivayat and Tradition, or like in India, Sanskriti, on, there are so many uh, honoring or honor killing the name of Sanskriti. So that kind of similarity is also there in Pakistan. So, let me see if I've got your question clearly. And what is the Salafi thinking about Islam? So I, I guess, first of all, you know that Salafis basically trace their knowledge to Quran and Hadith and the practices of Prophet Muhammad and his companions and then Taibin. Uh, but, you know, when you go to Saudi Arabia or talk to Salafis, it becomes very clear that there are Salafis and there are variations of Salafism as well. Uh, what, when I talk about how the Salafi notion of woman has been brought into Pakistan, what I'm talking about is the idea which says that women from very sort of simplified, and I'm really stripping it of all the nuanced differences, that women operates within the family sphere and it's religiously enjoined. Uh, woman is a carer and a natural and has to be subsumed to men. And it clearly identifies even the spaces in which women can operate. You know, within, if you go outside the family sphere, <clears throat> where else can you go and under what circumstances? Should you be covered? just your face, your hair, your total self, what are the different degrees? 
So I think that real essence of Salafi notion of an ideal Muslim woman isn't just simply about religious thinking, but it links thinking to the practices and how you manifest that into your everyday living as an individual, but also as member of a family. So women doesn't exist outside the family setup. So you're right in lots of ways, such understanding of place given to women in Islam, which I don't agree. I, I come from a very different interpretation of what women's rights and position is in this. But if you have that Salafi view of Islam and Muslim women, when you bring it into South Asia, Pakistan, India, and in line with other traditions as well, at one level, it's very easy because you're really bringing it in and saying it in your own language because you're saying women should be restricted to this area. I think with the way JUD has tried to present their idea is that they haven't just simply provided the information. They've also said, this is the context in which you're operating. And that context isn't just simply Pakistani context. It's also global context. And it's not just simply political global context, but also a global economic context in which women are operating. And then say within this, what is it that you have to do? And it's with reference to that, that then they start talking about what a Muslim woman has to do or not do. For example, one thing that I'm just thinking is the number of articles that you can see that talk about women and fashion industry. Yes, women yes. in advertising. Uh, and in that, what they really say is that, you know, when you go and do purchase jewelry or when you especially purchase uh, makeup stuff, uh, cosmetics, what you forget is that it's part of a uh, Zionist uh, business network and the Christian network. And when you're buying that, you're actually paying money for them. So you're not really being a good Muslim because you've actually gone beyond just being a woman to supporting something that is hurting Muslims. So don't do that. And if you have to advertise it, don't use the words that are un-Islamic and don't use women for that. Now, in that sense, you could say that they're very similar to a lot of other movements that are emerging, but the way it's done is using religious ideas. So yes, it's similar to the cultural norms that are present in South Asia and their similarities, but the way they have used that or the way they have approached this issue is different because I haven't come across, and if you have, I'd love to, literature which tells women, <coughs> sorry, that really you're part of a global uh, network, you are a pawn in that game and you need to get out of that for religious reasons. And that's where I'd see the difference. I don't know, again, does that answer your question? Because that's what I could understand. Because yeah. there was a bit of a noise behind there. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. You're um, not just being kind <laughs> to me, are you? Please say <laughs> No, no, I'm sure it has. Uh, Professor Yasmin, we usually close here, but it's not every day that we get you. So if you have time, we'll extend it by a few minutes. Is it okay with you? Sure. Sure. Right. Okay, because I can see a lot of interest being generated. So Divya says she's not able to, her connection is really weak, but just on her behalf, and I think a bit continuation what you just mentioned, uh, I'm just choosing one of the questions. She's asking what kind of incentives and roles are assigned for women for their involvement in jihad? I mean, how do you attract them inside it, I guess? Well, uh, first of all, I think initially, my reading is the women who were involved in the first Lashkar Toiba and then Jamaat ud Dawa, they were related to the men who were already involved in these groups. So it was the close family networks and they got together. So that started it off. Uh, but later on, I think after Kargil crisis, there's been a very clear effort to get other women involved in that. 
And what kind of a promise do you give? Basically, what's interesting is that it's promises for uh, your the life after, not promise here. It's about you being a good Muslim woman, uh, listening to what God wants you to do, and then behaving so that in the day of judgment, you'd come out of it okay. In fact, if anything, I often joke about the fact that instead of giving them incentives other than this promise of heaven, and they expect women to do a lot. Uh, like there was one uh, pamphlet which is written about uh, what women need to do and others to promote jihad. And there was a lot of stuff about in it about women giving up their jewelry uh, to just support jihad. And that's a really good Muslim woman who would do that. And every time I read that, I smiled and I thought, why would any woman want to, first of all, leave her husband, tell her husband to go to jihad, tell her kids to go to jihad, and also throw away the jewelry in there and say, here, here, take that as well. I think they expect women to give up worldly expectations for the sake of that promise. Uh, but that's a message that I think is not peculiar to Jamaat al-Dawa. Because if we look at, uh, let's say if we draw a comparison with what happened in so-called Islamic State, Again, a lot of women, they, you know, foreign fighters, they just left wherever they were, including from Australia, because they had this promise that one, they'll recreate a caliphate, but then it would give them the promise of a world life after that would be really good for them. So they'll go straight to heaven. So in that sense, I think incentive is really a good life after death. Uh, and the roles that are signed, as I've said, and I think I could have spent more time on that. Basically, there was a lot of emphasis on them being supporters of jihad. So they create, that's why they give all the jewelry to men. Uh, but then overall, their agency, and I think, uh, Shrita, you talked about that when you were introducing the topic. The notion of their agency or activism started undergoing a change in the new millennium for Jamaat al -Dawa. And what we see is that they are encouraged, as I said, want to play a role vis-a-vis -vis the children, but also in the social welfare space. And they operate in the earthquake in 2005 and lots of floods. And those stories keep on being repeated. And often what you'd find is that one story is presented about, for example, how they help people in earthquake. And then 10 years down the line, it would be repeated to say, we remember what happened and how we help people. So their role has been extended to include social welfare activities. Uh, teaching in the women only uh, groups has also been uh, greatly expanded. Uh, and if I'm to go to my observations that I sort of made visiting some of their mosques, I'd also gradually realized that they would use the spaces that for women also to bring children and then start educating them as well. So it's not just simply books for them, but mothers being and other women being the uh, role models for these kids. So I think these are the roles clearly see, but as, as I had ended my presentation, uh, what they don't want these women to engage in is combat, is actual combat activities. There's very little that I had find. Just a few references to Dukhtarani Millet, but overall, uh, most of the literature that I've read is about women as a social being, women as a, an economic being, women as a political being, but women not as a jihadi, active jihadi being. I, I hope, Divya, that answers your question. I'm sure it does. That is. Uh, Mudassar, would you want to come in here? Thank you, Professor. Uh, I think that was a wonderful uh, you know, exposition on how Salafi ideas are used, uh, both in terms of hybridizing and, you know, uh, you know, you were talking about indigenizing the ideas and using it to mobilize uh, new people and recruitment and everything. I really thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Uh, I just actually, uh, my question is maybe a slightly diversion from the, uh, the 
kind of discussion which we are having so far my question was uh, and more because of ignorance uh, i mean how far the ban of i mean ban on the jud has that impacted their reach and influence i mean to what extent the ban has been effective that's a very good question that's what again i was hinting at that uh, see i would i always say that i can only comment on what i know i i can sort of see or i can establish one thing that i've noticed sort of over the number of years that i've been doing research on this <coughs> there were places i could go to pick up their there was absolutely no issue and uh, if i didn't get them i could ask someone to say could you please get them for me and so i got used to it but late last year when i went to pakistan and then early this year there were few times i went to these places to see if i can get those books but it was covered there was no one uh, in fact uh, there was just one person sitting by the gate saying nope they are gone so the public dissemination of this information that i've been talking about that's definitely gone so i haven't been able to get um partly because the day i arrived in western australia soon after that there was a lockdown so i haven't been back but until the last day i knew that i couldn't get any more publications of that but that's one thing that's the narrative the second bit i think that's where the idea of generational transmission of knowledge becomes relevant is that having already gone through say for example early 1990 to till now even if we say that okay last year it all got stopped and nothing is being given can we logically assume that those ideas have suddenly disappeared my assessment as someone who studies this and how ideas move i would say it would be not logical to assume that they have gone there are definitely people who still subscribe to those ideas uh, where the fear comes in is that interestingly half is say then his people because they were working on behalf of certain the establishment they had a very clear idea of the extent to which they would let these people go i think where the problem comes in is that if they don't have that control or not the same degree then there's a possibility that some of these people who were converted to jamaat ud dawa thinking but now feel that they can't be as active or as agentic as they were they could be taken in by other groups so the sideways you know movement of jihadi groups that's not peculiar to pakistan it exists in lots of places so i think that danger would exist but even if that hasn't existed or hasn't eventuated i still think we can't expect that those ideas have disappeared particularly with the kids who have been given stories mm. so i mean how do we expect them suddenly to say okay mummy isn't telling me the story but life has changed now does that but again i'm only sort of giving you my assessment i haven't been able to get any data i think christine fair has a way of assessing yeah, but because i haven't followed that approach i've looked at what they publish and how they publish and why they say what they do that's all what i can say thank you um so kesha would you want to come in but as i was thinking a very interesting talk of course but the one topic that i don't i don't want to sound vulgar and i don't want to sound uh, out of place but some of these women who are being forced into jihadis are also being uh, forced into sexual uh, uh, slavery literally and and i wonder whether there is any kind of linkage between the frustration that is built within the salafi movements and the way that these women are being programmed essentially to take care of these frustrated men this is not a topic that we talk about very often 
But should, should we really raise this very sensitive question and whether or not one way to handle this frustration is to come to terms with what is creating this frustration? Again, as I said, I don't want to sound vulgar, but I thought I was, as you were talking, this thought crossed my mind. No, it's, it's a great question, uh, but uh, let me, I'm glad you've asked that because I think in lots of ways when we talk about uh, jihadi women or jihadi Salafi women in the Middle East and even in other places, uh, you can see the process playing out as you're talking about. Uh, it's not, it's nothing to do with being vulgar or anything. I think that's the reality. When we're looking at a phenomena, what can be more vulgar than killing people, you know? So I think if they can do that, so th that discussion I don't have a problem with. But with reference to Jumat Dawa women, uh, it's very interesting because they really operate in a very different form. Uh, they're very sort of the notion of modesty or honor and uh, simplicity that really takes over their lives. So that's where they're really significant as agents of jihadi activity or supporters of jihad by not being out there. So it's not, it's, it's not their sexuality played out in the larger jihad project. It's their sexuality and their motherly identity played out within the family sphere that really distinguishes them. So in that sense, they're different from you know, those uh, temporary brides that ISIS people decided to have, uh, which, you know, they picked up on the Shia thinking, but she has got very upset about that because they didn't think it was their thinking. But that's a separate, uh, that's a separate scene from Jamaat Dawa women. Thank you. Professor Beetle, would you want to come in here? Thank you, Sri Radha. But no, I just enjoyed the talk and I will continue if you continue for a few more minutes. It's fascinating, really. Uh, any, anybody else here who wants to ask? I know we are holding uh, Professor Yasmin back, but as I said, it's not too often we get her, so I thought we should make the most of this time. Uh, Professor Pant, I'm not sure if he's uh, connected, but I can see him. Uh, Alvite, you wanted to say something? Yes, why don't you come? come. Thank you, Professor. I had come across some of your work uh, uh, when I was doing uh, this research on international terrorism with one of the organizations back in Delhi here. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit of a comparison with the kind of uh, participations of women folks in the battlefield. Uh, mm -hmm. Because Australia also, since you are in Australia, uh, Australia has witnessed a large number of uh, ISIS supporters with regard mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. And there is also a growing concern about their returns and what kind of impact they could have in the country. Mm -hmm. The interesting part is like some of the women folk in Australia are also encouraging their husbands to be a part of the you know, jihadi activism uh, uh, despite the decline of the activities in West, in the Middle East right now, so how do you see the compare? How do you compare the kind of activism that you see in South Asia, particularly in the Afghan region, mm -hmm. and then of the you know, the potential uh, activities they could have in Australia? Okay, uh, when it comes to women here trying to encourage their men to go out as foreign fighters, and I think that phenomenon is in that strong because it has been stopped also because ISIS is in there or so-called Islamic State is in there but the drivers of that I think are different from the drivers of how Jamaat Dawa women would operate in Pakistan mm -hmm. the drivers of uh, women promoting militancy among men members male members in Australian Indian Muslims and some who are not Muslims but are then converted to Islam and then go and join jihad in uh, that so-called Islamic State. I think they came more from the need for uh, creating a sense of identity, you know, finding a place as to where 
they really fit in this world. Uh, and it's a phenomenon we're also seeing now in terms of the right-wing extremists, that if you feel unsettled about you know, the impact of globalization, you're trying to find your place. So how do you say that I'm a valuable member of this human community? In that, in case of Australian Muslims, uh, I think sadly at the after 9-11, because the community learned gradually about what kind of different groups are trying to entice Muslims into how to be good Muslims, it opened up a little bit of space for militant thinking. So I still remember uh, sort of soon after 9-11, there was a huge uh, hall full of people with one speaker who was trying to tell people to become good Muslims. And at the end of it, he uh, had this show with lots of uh, present, you know, show bags and had a list of people who stood up and said, now they've converted to Islam. And I was sort of smirking, thinking, just after one lecture, you've converted this six, seven of people to Islam. But that was because it was his message he was giving to these men and women that Islam, and by extension, jihadism was the answer, or doing something for the Muslim cause. I think that process opened up the space for young Muslims, men and women, to be taken in with, by this idea of finding salvation in being better Muslims. So that's where you can see how some women would be encouraging other men, also because the young generation has been a lot more savvy using social media, so they came into contact with this information. When we're looking at jihadi women in Pakistan, but especially the jamaat ad dawa ones, because that's what I've done the work on, I think it's a different story. They are not the ones convincing their men to go to jihad. The literature is published by men with female partners to the project, and then those female partners to the project that it is their responsibility to support jihad. And to that extent, again, because we don't, I haven't really interviewed women like that. We don't know whether they willingly told the men to go and fight jihad. But my sense looking at the literature is that it was more than being made accepting of this idea that, that men have to go to jihad and that they have to accept whatever trials and tribulations they have to deal with because the men are going to jihad, not so much telling them to go to jihad. Uh, there's a slight difference in there. That's really what, and I think there are two different spaces in which we're looking at jihad and its manifestation. Um, thank you, Professor Yasmin. I can't thank you enough, really. I mean, you know, the, your depth and your, you know, the nuances and the complexities all simply just comes through in, uh, you know, this uh, lecture that you've given us. And I'll just hand over to Kumar for his. Thank you.